and then the unthinkable happened. Knowing that Beijing controlled enough votes in the Legislative Council, protesters surrounded the complex earlier in the morning, successfully preventing lawmakers from convening. I was then serving my third jail sentence. For a moment, I wonder why the news channel was replaying footage of the Umbrella Movement. Although it was not long before I realized Hong Kongers were back with even stronger determination. Lam suspended the bill on June 15, but fell short of fully withdrawing it. A historical two million dem people demonstrate the following day, equivalent to one in four out of our entire population. I'm not aware of anything comparable to this level of discontent against a government in modern history. I was released exactly three months ago, on June 17, and have since joined fellow Hong Kongers to protest in the most creative ways possible. In addition to the bill withdrawn, we demand Lam to retract label on us as rioters, drop all political charges, and conduct an independent investigation into police brutality. Some of us crowdfunded for newspaper advertisement ahead of the G20 summit in late June, calling for the world not to look at Hong Kong. Others entered the Chamber of Legislative Council complex on July 1st, the same day another half million Hong Kongers protest peacefully. Crowd continued to show up in large number in the past 15 weekends, with small rallies taking place almost daily across the territories. But the government would not listen. Instead of defusing the political crisis, it dramatically empowered the riot police. The movement reached a turning point on 21 of July. That night, pro-Beijing fobs with suspect ties to organized crime gathered in the Yunnong train station and indiscriminately attacked not just protesters returning home, reporters on the scene, but even passers by. The police refused to show up despite repeat emergency call, plucking Hong Kong into a police state with more violence. On August 5th alone, the day Hong Kongers participate in a general strike, riot police shoot 800 canisters of tear gas to disperse the peaceful mass. Compare that to only 87 fire in the entire umbrella movement five years ago. The police excessive force today is clear. Their excessive use of pepper spray pepper balls, rubber bullets, beanbag rounds, and water cannons, almost all of which are imported from Western democracy, are no less troubling. In light of this, I applaud Chairman McGovern and Congressman Smith for introducing the Protect Hong Kong Act last week. Americans' company must not profit from the violence crackdown of freedom-loving Hong Kongers. Co-Chairman Rubio is also right for recently writing that Hong Kong's special status under American law depends on the city being treated as a separate customs area. Beijing should not have it both ways, wrapping all the economic benefit of Hong Kong's standing in the world while erosion of our freedom. This is the most important reason why the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act enjoys the broad support of Hong Kong civil society. Lam finally withdrew the bill earlier this month. But just as protesters have long stopped calling for her resignation, this decision was almost meaningless by now. The movement is far from over because it has long moved beyond one bill or one person. Our most important demand is genuine structural change in Hong Kong, which means free election. Our government's lack of representation lies at the heart of the matter. As I speak, Hong Kong is standing at a critical juncture. The stakes have never been higher. We are confronted by the huge Chinese military build-up just across the border in Shenzhen. President Xi Jinping is unlikely to take hardline action before the upcoming National Day in October. But no one can be sure what's next. Sending in the tanks remains irrational, but not impossible. With Chinese interference in Taiwan, Tibet, and especially Xinjiang, it serves as a reminder that Beijing is prepared to go far in pursuit of its grand imperial project. I was once the face of Hong Kong's youth activism. In this leaderless movement, 
my sacrifice are minimal compared to those among us who have been laid off of protesting, who have been injured but too afraid of even going to a hospital, or who have been forced to take their own life, to have each lot and eyes. The youngest of the 1,500 arrested so far is only 12 years old schoolboy. I don't know them personally, yet their pain is my pain. We belong to the same community, struggling for our right of self-determination, so we can build one brighter and common future. A child born today will not even have celebrated his or her 28th birthday by 2047, when the 50 years unchanged policy is set to expire. That deadline is closer to us than it appears. There's no return for us. Decades from now, when historians look back, I'm sure that 2019 will turn out to have been a watershed. I hope historians will celebrate the United States Congress for having stood on the side of Hong Kongers, the side of human rights and democracy. God bless Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ho, welcome. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Co-Chairman Robio, and the members of this commission for holding this hearing and for having us here at this very critical moment for Hong Kong. For more than 100 days now, young people in Hong Kong have been at the forefront of our resistance. This is a leaderless movement with widespread participation from people of all walks of life. It is a fight for democracy, a fight for human rights, and most of all, a fight for universal values. What started in June as a one million people march has morphed into a struggle for fundamental political reform in Hong Kong. Chief Executive Carrie Lam's misjudgments and arrogance worsened the situation, resulting in a total clampdown of the Beijing government over Hong Kong's affairs. To date, more than 1,500 Hong Kongers, the youngest at the age of 12 years old, have been unreasonably arrested. Sadly, it has become a daily occurrence to see youngsters being pinned to the ground with head concussions if not being knocked unconscious. On the other hand, riot police and plainclothes officers have since early on deliberately hidden their ID numbers and warrant cards, making it impossible for us to even certify their legitimacy, let alone hold them accountable. On August 21st, police from the Special Tactical Unit charged into Prince Edward MTR station, beating up passengers randomly. They then shut down the station for 24 hours, refusing medical care for those who were injured, raising even suspicions of possible deaths in the station. Separately, now they will be charging in secondary school yards, shopping malls and buses, where young people merely dressed in black can be searched or even arrested without justification. In other words, merely being young is a crime in the police state of Hong Kong. The protests began with an extradition bill, but at the core it has always been about these fundamental conflicts between two very different set of values. On one hand, the China model, which has no respect over human rights and the rule of law, and our hybrid city that has enjoyed these very freedoms for the most of its existence with a deep attachment to these universal values that the United States and other Western societies treasure. Hong Kong represents something unique in the world. We have long held dear our rule of law, transparent institutions and the freedom of expression in a part of the world where these are most often threatened than upheld. However, this system is now under great threat. Companies like Hong Kong's major airline, Cathay Pacific, has succumbed to political pressure, firing dozens of employees due to their political stance. The business commu community is coerced into making political decisions. As a singer and activist from Hong Kong, I have experienced the suppression firsthand. Ever since the Umbrella Movement in 2014, I have been blacklisted by the communist government. My songs and my name are censored on Chinese internet. 
Pressured by the Chinese government, sponsors have pulled out, even international brands have kept their distances. For the past five years, and even more so recently, China tried to smear and silence me with their propaganda machines spreading false claims. Right now, I am facing threats from pro-Beijing supporters and could face arrest and prosecution at any time. Not only have I faced difficulties in both China and Hong Kong, but the self-censorship has now spread towards global institutions and cities. Recently, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, denied a venue to an event of Chinese artist Ba Liu Cao and myself due to security concerns. Celebrities from Hong Kong, Taiwan and China are all pressured into voicing their unanimous support for the Beijing government and could be condemned for keeping their silence. Hong Kongers are now living in a constant fear and have unfortunately lost the most of our freedoms. For a city that has been famously known as politically indifferent, the younger generations have took up the road to safeguard our home, standing up courageously to the corrupted system in spite of increased suppression. To the rest of the world, the United States is often a symbol of freedom and democracy. The freedom Americans enjoy is something that the people of Hong Kong have long hoped for. Even though our languages and cultures differ, what we have in common is the pursuit for justice, freedom and democracy. Through the challenges of Hong Kong, the West is also waking up to, the China, to China's insinuating power in a global scale. Hong Kong is connected to the world in multiple ways, but China is trying to isolate it to exert control. If Hong Kong falls, it would easily become the springboard for the totalitarian regime of China to push its rules and priorities overseas, utilizing its economic, economic powers to conform others to their communist values, just as they have done with Hong Kong in the past 22 years. The US and its allies have everything to fear if they wish to maintain a world that is free, open and civil. I therefore urge the US Congress to stand by Hong Kong and most of all, to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. This is not a plea for the so-called foreign interference. This is a plea for democracy. This is a plea for the freedom to choose. And lastly, I would like to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, your most beloved first lady. You gain strength, courage and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. This is a global fight for the universal values that we all cherish. And Hong Kong is in the very front lines of this fight. We are once fearful of what might have come with our silence. And for that, we have now become fearless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jung, welcome. Chairman McGovern, Co-Chairman Woodbill, and members of the committee, thank you for your invitation to this hearing. Last year, Chinese President Xi Jinping said in a cold storm meeting that China would never embrace the judicial independence in the West. This is why people in Hong Kong are trying hard to reject the extradition bill because we do not believe in a country who looks down on human rights, disqualifying our legislators and kidnapping our booksellers. We want to protect our legal system as the last barrier against Beijing's political interference. Apart from asking for the withdrawal of the bill, Hong Kong people also demand for an investigation into police brutality to save Hong Kong from turning into a police state. More importantly, we demand for the un universal suffrage. We deeply believe that without any structural political reform and a government chosen by the people, there is no possibility for Hong Kong to restore prosperity. We cannot have a society compromising the interests of individuals. The voice of these people should always be heard. Unfortunately, our government ignores our demands by saying that we have no stake in the society. Our student union members are detained, followed, beaten, and threatened. During the, deten the detainment, one of our student union members were told by the police that it was reasonable for them to rape some female protester when they frequently worked overtime. Besides, the authority tries to stop us from having peaceful car strike when more than 50,000 students participating in it. 
people who side with Beijing are now advocating to install surveillance cameras inside the classroom to monitor teachers and students to, who dare to support class strike and support the movement. This apparently violates our academic freedom and freedom of speech. This is the rights terror created by the Beijing government, which should be alerted by all people here. Nowadays, students and Hong Kong people are even ready to die for Hong Kong, and some already did. They believe that the only limit to their freedom is their death. This is the ultimate sacrifice for the motherland, and we must not forget them. Many students face strong obstruction from their family. Some of them are even forced to leave home. But they still choose to head to the front line, carrying a letter with their last will. They are determined. They understand that the price of freedom is high. It always has been. But it is a price they are willing to pay, and it is a path of liberation they are willing to choose. We do not fight for freedom out of passion. Passion will burn out. We fight for freedom from a sense of duty and dignity. China is rising. China is using its nationalism and invasive economic dominance to colonize small countries and put intense pressure on people and companies like Cafe Pacific who do not conform to them. Teachers, students, civil servants, businessmen are all facing political purge in Hong Kong. This new form of imperialism of China poses a severe threat to Hong Kong. This is a clash of values and system. We need to contain the Communist Party of China. Offering help to Hong Kong is the primary move to contain China. One country, two system will expire in 2047. US government should help Hong Kong people have the right to decide our future. Therefore, we urge the US Congress to pass the Human Rights and Democracy Act to expand the current sanction list to all individuals who infringe our human rights. Moreover, if a genuine universal suffrage cannot be achieved immediately, our autonomy and rule of law will continue to erode. The situation of China manipulating Hong Kong as a backdoor for trading with Iran and North Korea will also continue. Then, the U.S. government should not acknowledge the special status of Hong Kong. U.S. must send a strong signal that this special status should be cancelled if Hong Kong lost its autonomy in order to put pressure on China. Otherwise, China will keep taking advantage of Hong Kong as an international society but hollow out our liberal values. With such an assertion, to fight for democracy and freedom. As, Tal as Thomas Jefferson once said that, he would be forever for against any form of tyranny. And I believe this is the time for Amer Americans to stand with Hong Kong. Wong Fuk Hong Kong, Si Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hong, welcome. Thank you. Chairman McGovern, Co-Chair Rubio and members of the Commission, thank you for this opportunity. It's an honor for me to stand in solidarity with the frontline activists. I want to thank the Commission members for their critical support for the Hong Kong people and your leadership on the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and the Protect Hong Kong Act. Over the past three months, the whole world has witnessed the historic David and Goliath standoff. And against all odds, the Hong Kong people are standing up to the powerful authoritarian regime in Beijing. In this historic battle, they are not only fighting for the democratic future of 7.4 million Hong Kong people, but they're holding the regional and global front line on preserving human dignity and rights for all people. As Congressman McGovern has already mentioned, the past summer of discontent is in fact part of years of ongoing resistance by the Hong Kong people against Beijing's encroachment on Hong Kong's autonomy, rights, and freedom. The mass demonstrations in the past have included resistance against security legislation, official brainwashing initiatives, and the gutting of the promised genuine universal suffrage. After the clearance of the Occupy Central sites, democracy activists left a promise inscribed on the concrete sidewalks. We will return. They have kept that promise. 
Instead of Beijing's hoped for movement fatigue, the protests supported by unflagging solidarity and broad diverse participation of Hong Kong society are moving into the 15th week, pressing for now five non-negotiable demands. The out of control lawless actions of the Hong Kong police have provided mobilization fuel for Hong Kong people to add oil. As Chairman Mao said, wherever there is suppression, there will be resistance. And at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, he also said, anyone who crushes the student mo movement will not have a good ending. The, I want to talk about the rule of law just briefly because there are tensions that were baked into the one country, two systems framework, making one country, one system, or one and a half system perhaps an inevitable outcome. Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen's takeaway from the current political crisis hits the nail on the head. Not only is one country, two systems not a viable model for Taiwan, but the Hong Kong example proves that dictatorship and democracy cannot coexist. An independent functioning rule of law is essential, yet the Chinese state constitution and numerous high-level policy pronouncements legitimizes the subordination of law to the leadership of the party. The reintroduction of the Article 23 legislation that's in the works in Hong Kong will inevitably carry imprints of the party's concepts of national security. Second, the demand for complete loyalty to the party guts the independence of key pillars of rule of law, legal profession, and the media. But Hong Kong is not the mainland yet. Despite efforts like the proposed Hong Kong national anthem law and proposed loyalty requirements, loyalty, pride, and love cannot be legislated. So it's not surprising that Hong Kong people, foreign business, and the international community have been alarmed. The um, outrageous and painful excessive violence and abuse of law by the police have already been uh, extensively um, described. I will move to then talking about what's at stake in terms of the universal values. China's aggressive activism at the UN is undermining international standards, weakening the existing human rights mechanisms, and restricting the participation of independent civil society. This cuts Hong Kong people, as well as human rights defenders on the mainland, and Tibetan and Uyghur communities, from the key international platforms that's available to press for accountability. With this, instead of the West's hope for convergence, China is not only playing by the rules, it is vocally and persistently asserting a set of relativist criteria that it alone can apply and pushing for Chinese models of human rights, democracy, and development. That is, no human rights, no development, and no democracy. This rhetoric helps to intimidate, silence, and deflect from the accountability of the state. I want to point quickly to uh, its role in blocking independent voices. China sits on the ECOSOC committee of the um, UN, and gongos, who do not face any objections, such as the interruptions of Denise Ho's recent intervention at the Human Rights Council. The intervention last week by Patsy Ho, the representative of the Hong Kong Federation of Women, is illustrative. She not only defended the SAR government's handling of the protests, but she accused the Hong Kong protesters of child exploitation and more. Patsy Ho, co-chairman and director of Macau Casino Operation, and is also a standing committee member of the Beijing Municipal Committee of the Chinese People's Consultative Conference. Um, because I am out of time, I want to uh, really take the time to jump ahead to the problem of a, in addition to the disinformation campaign, including the egregious use by the China Daily on 9-11, of a photo depicting the destruction of the World Trade Towers to warn of terrorist attacks by Hong Kong protesters. Beijing is advancing a narrative of violence to frame the Hong Kong protests that is echoed uncritically by the international community. Within this framework, the Hong Kong police, protected in full tactical gear, armed with rubber bullets, guns, tear gas, pepper spray, and batons, wielding the coercive power of the state, is presented as one side, a 
of an escalating violence clashes with civilian protesters. Hence, we hear both sides calls to de-escalate, but this deflects attention away from police accountability for its excessive use of force and its complicity with non-state violence. Moreover, the narrow violence framing of the situation on the ground is erasing or marginalizing intentionally the proliferation of diverse, peaceful, creative and peaceful protests by the Hong Kong people, including by students in boycotts, elderly citizens, silver hair volunteers protecting the children actions, Hong Kong people singing in the malls, in the metro stations, in neighborhood gatherings, shouting the 10 p.m. shouts of slogans echoing throughout all the neighborhoods in Hong Kong, and forming human chains, creating Lenin walls, and last Friday was Mid-Autumn Festival, and a small family-owned bakery in Saiwan made mooncakes with protest slogans. And in typical humorous Hong Kong fashion, Hong Kongers are creating art. This is what is happening on the ground. Hong Kong people are practicing democracy and exercising their freedoms for as long as possible. Hong Kongers are making the road by walking it. That is the real revolution already underway. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Garrett, uh, thank you for coming, and we welcome your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman McGovern and Rubio, distinguished members of the Commission. It is an honor and a privilege to talk with you regarding the Chinese Communist Party's erosion of one country, two systems in Hong Kong under the pretext of national security and its nexus to the extradition bill crisis. I'll begin with five key observations background the current China-Hong Kong conflict and the one country, two systems crisis. First, today's one country, two systems is not the same as Deng Xiaoping's notion that proffered peaceful coexistence between the communist and Hong Kong systems. Instead, it has been replaced by Xi Jinping's new era, one country, two systems model, embracing political struggle and enemy-friend binary, and foregrounding Chinese national security as the paramount lens for governing the special administrative region and implementing one country, two systems. Rather than a confidence-building mechanism ensuring peaceful coexistence, one country, two systems under Xi Jinping is now intended to advance and safeguard China's sovereignty, security, and development interests. Two, this new era one country, two systems model is informed by Xi Jinping's broader national security concepts known as the three major dangers and national security with Chinese characteristics. The former situates communist China at imminent risk of being invaded, toppled, and separated and its development, reform, and stability sabotaged, thereby leading to the derailing of China's rise, socialist modernization, and the one country, two systems policy. The latter dramatically broadens the notion of Chinese national security and radically expands the scope of Chinese authorities' prerogatives in administering one country, two systems. Consequently, it significantly erodes the special administrative region's high degree of autonomy diminishes Hong Kongers' freedoms and widens the threat to U.S. citizens and national interests in Hong Kong. Third, under Xi Jinping's new security paradigms and new, one, new era one country, two systems model, dissident Hong Kongers have been systematically enemified and securitized as mortal threats to the party state and banned or removed from positions of political power. Elections have been partially nullified, Hong Kongers disenfranchised, and terrorized with real and rhetorical political violence. The promise of Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong has been effectively replaced with the tyrannical role of patriots. Official declarations and party state media propagating Hong Konger enemy and Hong Kong threat security discourses have become ubiquitous, and cultural revolution like mass line and united front denunciation campaigns targeting Democrats, localists, and westernized Hong Kongers have swept the city repeatedly over the last seven years since Xi Jinping came to power. Four, since at least 2012, Hong Kong and one country, two systems have been perceived by Beijing as communist China's weakest links in its resurgent totalitarian national security state. For Chinese authorities, both are at the forefront of ideological confrontation with the United States and the West, a new Cold War in their terms. By the end of 2014 and the Umbrella Movement, the struggle to rule Hong Kong was said to have matched the intensity surrounding the 1997 handover and that China had to now rethink how to rule the enclave. An influential advisor to Chinese, senior Chinese authorities 
said that Hong Kong faced a society-wide, quote-unquote, long-term struggle to eradicate the party state's enemies in the city, a de facto cultural revolution that would involve, at a minimum, rectifying and synthesizing the judiciary, legislature, media, secondary schools, and universities. Chinese and special administrative regions furtive efforts to impose the communist legal, political, and social norms on Hong Kong via the extradition law and unprecedented violent suppression of protests have provoked the most severe crisis of one country, two systems, as Hong Kongers fight for their endangered freedoms, identity, and way of life. This is not an anomaly. It is the sixth Chinese governance crisis involving one country, two systems since 2003, and the fifth since Xi Jinping took control of Hong Kong affairs. Each has an underlying Chinese national security nexus seeking to broaden Beijing's powers, its so-called comprehensive jurisdiction in Hong Kong, and to roll back Hong Kongers' high degree of autonomy, liberal freedoms, and limited democracy by forcibly transforming Hong Kong into a Chinese communist city while maintaining a veneer of no changes. My next few observations will quickly touch upon the extradition law nexus to national security. Uh, Senior Chinese officials have described the battle, the extradition battle right now, as a quote-unquote battle of life and death and as a battle to defend Hong Kong. A decisive war defending one country's or two systems or jeopardizing it. Uh, since, 2000, since Xi Jinping came to power, national security is now a mandatory obligation for people in the Hong Kong SAR. This was never written in the original basic law. This has been done post facto since 2012. Early in the extradition law saga, senior Chinese leaders have made extra, extraordinary endorsements of the extradition law, expressing their full support. This included two Politburo Standing Committee members, Han Zhang and Wang Yang, the head of the State Council's Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, Zhang Xiaoming, and the chief of the Hong Kong SAR uh, liaison office, Wang Jimin. There are also indications that President Xi Jinping, as a member of the Central Coordination Group for Hong Kong and Macau Affairs, has weighed in. An, influ an influential United Front commentator and state media has also observed that if it were not for the full support of the central government, the legislation would have been aborted. Ch uh, Chief Executive Kerry Lam recently lamented in a leaked speech that since the issue had been elevated to one of national security and sovereignty, it had stripped her of any solutions or room for political maneuver. Another source explained that because the ELAB involved the mainland special administrative region relationship with the central government, and the implementation of the basic law, it was not a matter entirely within the autonomy of the special administrative region government. This touches upon the Hong Kongers five demands as well as US national security, US policy towards Hong Kong. Beijing's imposition of communist legal, political, and social national security norms on Hong Kong constitute a violation of Article 5 of the basic law prohibiting the introduction of the socialist system in the territory. Moreover, the party's application of its national security with Chinese characteristics, mandates, and loyalty expectations to the special administrative region and its civil servants effectively dissolves any difference between the communist and Hong Kong systems, thereby posing a significant threat to U.S. interests related to the protection of sensitive technologies and adherence to export controls. My last two comments uh, before I submit the rest of my testimony. Uh, the Hong Kong police force has been militarized and nationalized by the Chinese Communist Party, effectively becoming its little gun in the special administrative region. Since the beginning of 2019, mainland police have been tasked by President Xi with, quote unquote, preventing and countering color revolutions, unquote. China's public security minister subsequently ordered police to firmly, quote, firmly fight to protect China's political security, unquote, defend its national security and the leadership of the Communist Party. Earlier, Hong Kong police had received similar national security tasking from Vice Premier Han Zheng, who, in August 2018, charged them to, quote unquote, firmly and effectively safeguard China's national security and rule of law by accurately and comprehensively implementing one country, two systems. Also, according to a vice chairman of the State Council's Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies, the Hong Kong police were now, quote unquote, on the forefront when it came to curbing Hong Kong independence, which meant their duty was not just to maintain public order, but to defend national security too. Chinese, uh, our Chief Executive Kerry Lam in a leaked speech 
also iterated that the Hong Kong police were the only solution that they currently possess in dealing with the extradition process. Uh, in no small way, the Hong Kong police have become the special administrative region's people's armed police. My last comment. Chinese authorities have dedicated significant academic, legal, political propaganda and united front resources to systematically manipulating and recasting Deng Xiaoping's error content and understandings of the basic law in one country, two systems to accommodate Xi Jinping's totalitarian national security mandates, logics and outlook. The Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies or Hong Kong Macau Studies Association, a shadowy political warfare like think tank connected to the State Council's Hong Kong and Macau's Affairs Office is one of these new subversive vehicles. Concomitantly, a network of party state constitutional and basic law experts and scholars, some attached to the National People's Congress Standing Committee, Hong Kong Basic Law Committee, have similarly contributed significantly to the erosion of one country, two systems policy, mobilized political bonds, and informed the central authorities' understandings of the actual situation in the region. All these united frontiers are key players in the erosion of Hong Kong's freedoms and democracy and enablers of state tyranny. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll save my questions to the end. I'm going to yield now to the co-chair, Senator Rubio. Thank you. And I'll just ask one question because I know members have places to go and I want them to get in on this. But, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the key issue before us is autonomy. If you go back... Uh, in 2014, they took away universal suffrage for the chief executive. In 2016 and 17, they jailed, or, or I'm sorry, they disqualified six Democratic uh, lawmakers from legislative council seats using a very controversial uh, interpretation of the Hong Kong Constitution. And then in 2019, this effort at the extradition bill. So my question to the, all the panelists is, how would you describe the state of Hong Kong autonomy today? During the last congressional hearing, I strongly aware how one country, two system eroded to be one country, one and a half system. But the recent political crisis by how Hong Kong and Beijing government turned such a global city into the police state with more violence and even white terror, I would describe now is the collapse of one country, two system, and also we are, safe, we are facing the death under the current constitutional framework. And I think now is also the time and the reason which we hope to seek for bipartisan support. Support Hong Kong's democratization should not be the matter of left or right. It should be the matter of right or wrong. So um, on a more cultural and social context, uh, there is a immense fear among the people um, to speak their minds, which uh, is a result of how the businesses and the government institutions, they have um, put pressure onto their employees or the people to, uh, to keep their mouths shut, basically. And so um, this has a huge impact on the economy because um, you know, without this freedom of speech, it's, it's very difficult for the, econ uh, the economy and also the society to thrive because in, in a sense, we are already in somewhat of a China city situation where people would uh, fear for their safety if they spoke out uh, about their political stance. Um, just for an example, there has been a, an, an unofficial Hong Kong anthem recently that has been written by a anonymous uh, songwriter. And um, they have opted to keep their anon anonymity because um, if they have shown their faces, then most probably they would have been arrested or uh, prosecuted because of uh, on claims of national uh, threats, national security threats. So that's basically the sentiment on the grounds uh, for Hong Kong people. Last year, the USCC published a report concerns that Hong Kong is becoming more likely any, like any other Chinese city. And that means that our autonomy is already gone. And actually, even the USCC has issued a report to claim that the autonomy of Hong Kong is already in danger. In UK, when I met some politicians, I would tell them that the Chinese government already built 
the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And that's why I would say the autonomy of Hong Kong is already dead, and that's why we urge the US government and other free world countries try to help with Hong Kong with many, um, uh, like passing the Human Rights and Democracy Act. And you can pass the Global Medicine Act in other countries, urge your allies to pass them, to let other free world countries to stand with Hong Kong. The, um, the economy, Senator Rubio, question is extremely important because post-1989, um, that was a decision that was made by the Communist Party. We're going to go forth back into market and economic reforms, but absolutely no political reforms. This has been echoed by the chief executive when she n endlessly has been having these kind of ridiculous press conferences where she says nothing. One thing she does say is, we need to restore the economy. We need to restore economic order and completely ignoring the structural political issues that is causing a lot of the fundamental unrest. So the other point I wanted to add is that the Hong Kong economy was not delivering the goods to most of the Hong Kong people. The tycoons and probably the triads were doing quite well, but not the majority of Hong Kong people. Hence, we have the housing problem, the education problem, the problem of the elderly with not adequate care, and so forth, and health care. So the economy wasn't de delivering, and I think what needs to happen, yes, there should be a renewal of the economy, but it's going to be an economy that works for all the people. Um, if I could pick up quickly on Sonny's reference to autonomy. Autonomy, what it means for the Communist Party is we only need to look at the so-called autonomous regions of, in Tibet and Xinjiang. What autonomy means is no cultural, no language, no history, no right to believe or practice your faith under the sinicization of religion, which is an oxymoron. And their understanding of autonomy even extends to past this pre life. As you know, the party is trying to now control reincarnation. So they also trying to impose a notion of Chineseness. What kind of Chineseness? Well, Xi Jinping's notion of Chineseness under the Chinese dream and what is Chinese. But Hong Kongers are quite complex as a history and language and culture. And I think Hong Kongers are going and are negotiating what it means to be a Hong Konger, whether it includes being a Chinese. Does it mean that? And I think that's what it means to be free, the right to decide and determine in this complex way what does it mean to be who we are. And that is absolutely antithetical to the DNA of the Communist Party and its notion of autonomy, because it doesn't exist. Thank you. The rule of patriots in Hong Kong basically means that there is no substantive high degree of autonomy. Uh, basically, under Xi Jinping, a democratic centralism is practiced. Uh, they may solicit input from the Hong Kong government, but once Beijing makes a decision, the SAR government has to implement it. Um, uh, building on uh, uh, Dr. Holmes' comments here, National identity is now a national security issue for the Communist Party in Hong Kong. And they believe that one of the major problems, this goes back to 2007, when uh, Hu Jintao told the Hong Kong government on the 10th anniversary that the SAR government had to create a new generation of Hong Kongers who loved one country, two systems, who loved China. Uh, that the recovery of Hong Kong would not be complete until Hong Kongers identified with China, with communist China. Uh, this also touches on uh, Xi Jinping's Chinese communist identity politics, which is attempting to rehabilitate the spoiled image of the communist party and the spoiled image of being a communist. Uh, this is why we start seeing laws protecting the national anthem, martyrs and so forth like this. And so in Hong Kong, which has always been historically anti-communist to a large degree, uh, there is this effort related to the extradition campaign to eradicate so-called anti-communist sentiment and anti-communist forces. Um, with regards to autonomy, um, because the Belt and Road Initiative and the Greater Bay Area Initiatives are key to China's development program right now, and because the central government believes that the major impediment to Hong Kong signing on and strongly supporting these programs has been the two systems, has been its democracy, has been its freedoms. It is now looking to restrict those in order to force the SAR government 
to support these programs. So once again, in closing, I would say there is no substantive autonomy. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Swazi. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Chairman Rubio for holding this hearing. We appreciate you bringing this together. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Representative Smith, Ranking Member Smith, for the work that you've done on this issue for so many years. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you for the information you've given us here today and for shining a light on this. I know we, we sit here in this, in this chamber. It's, it's very calm. It's very safe. It's very sterile. And you're bringing to life what's going on in real people's lives right now. When you talk about a 12-year-old being arrested, when we hear the idea that someone gets pepper spray sprayed into their wound, when we see, hear about people's heads being smashed into the concrete and getting concussions, and we hear about the rubber bullets and the tear gas and everything else, and people living in fear on a regular basis for standing up, for speaking their minds. Here in the United States of America, we've believed for, since Nixon went to China, that the more that China was exposed to our way of life in the United States and to the West, that they would become more like us. We always thought they'd become, you know, they, if they saw capitalism, they saw democracy, sooner or later they'd become more and more like us. And we now know that that's not at all the case. Whether the hearings we've held about the Uyghurs or the hearings about Tibet or now about Hong Kong, we know that they're, they're pulling, you know, we talk about Hong Kong as being, as being one country, two systems, it's really one world with two models, and they're meeting each other in Hong Kong right now. And the question is, which model is gonna win? Is it gonna be the model that we promote here in the United States with the rule of law, and with freedom of expression, and with democracy? Or is it gonna be authoritarianism and, and the, 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 the powerful forces of the government doing whatever they want, whatever they, way they want? They're meeting right there, and you're right in the middle of that challenge right now, so we're so grateful to all of you. So I'm concerned about the timing of things right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're pushing to, to get this bill passed here in the Congress, but right now we've got, uh, I think you talked about it, Joshua, the National Day in China is coming up on October 1st. And I'm concerned about what mainland China's actions are gonna be in relation to that, and whether there'll be more violence will result as they try to flex their authority. And I'd like to hear each of you talk about that. And the second thing I'm concerned about are the local elections coming up uh, in November. And I want to hear about from you about the, uh, whether you believe that there's an opportunity here for the people of Hong Kong to express themselves, or is there being, or is the mainland trying to subvert that by not permitting certain candidates to run and, and not giving them permission to run, which is, you know, a, a foreign idea to hear us here in the United States of America, but so important to all of you. And the third timing is, is let's say a magic wand was all of a sudden waved and, 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 and mainland China said, you know, we're gonna support the idea of there being elections in the future in, in Hong Kong for the, for the leader. Instead of Carrie Lam being appointed, it'd be you know, an election by the people. That couldn't happen right away. It would take some time. I'd like to hear what you think about the timing. So let's try and keep it brief. I know I, I talked a lot myself and used up a lot of time. But please just, October 1st, election day, and how impactful that can be. Uh, and what, what the timing would be if, if they were to agree as one of the five demands that there would be universal suffrage. So Joshua, you go first, please. Apart from, apart from troops were already moved to the border a few weeks ago, that's the tactics for Beijing authorities to generate the chilling effect. We're strongly aware on how Carrie Lam, the leader of Hong Kong, openly declared that she is considering to impose emergency ordinance in Hong Kong to stop the protests. Emergency ordinance is the colonial era law, similar as martial law. It authorized the power for chief executive of Hong Kong to shut down the internet, cut the public transport, and even cut the air traffic. We all know that political crisis must solved by political system reform. That's the reason we urge Beijing not to handpick the leader. Please let us enjoy the right of free election. But they just conduct and consider to use this kind of martial law before or after the Chinese National Day. I think that's the reason not only people with defense on human rights must care about, even businessmen that focus on and enjoying economic freedom and open business environment. They should aware on how Hong Kong is not only on the brink of Russia, it's also under the threat of those martial law and white terror. So I really hope to have bipartisan support to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. 
uh, after explaining what's happening before after Chinese National Day, the upcoming district council elections scheduled on 24 of November, with the track record of how Beijing unseat democratically elected lawmaker including Nathan Law and Agnes Chow, the one who hoped to run for office on early last year. We strongly expect and aware that Beijing will still keep its hardline policy to Hong Kong and to block or buy youngsters to run for office. As the one who engaged in street activism, I also hope the voice of young generation could be heard inside the institution. And at the same time, I also will make certain announcements uh, in the late September or early October for myself will run for office on the district council or not. If Beijing government banned me to run for office, they must need to pay the price on, this, on, Hong, Kong, on Hong Kong protests and also in the international communities. So in Hong Kong, there are many pan-democratics and many pro-Beijing folks. Is there a chance that that could change, that that dynamic could change because of the protests in, that are going on? In district council, we have 452 seats and more than 75% of the seats are almost dominated by pro-Beijing camp. And on 24th of November, we hope pro-democratic camp can get a good turnout to show the power of people. So I just want to you know, emphasize the timing coming up. October 1st and November 24th are big days that could have a big impact on what Beijing is doing and what is happening from the people. And it could be a, a flashpoint. We have to be very conscious of that. Denise, do you want to go ahead? Yes, personally, I don't feel that um, October 1st would be something to stop the people from going onto the streets, as the sentiment is still very, very determined and very strong uh, among all walks of life. And so um, th this fight has been able to, to sustain itself because of this sort of creativity and the flexibility of the people. And so I believe that without a, a, a sincere answer or, or a solution from the government, the people won't be backing down. And so um, on, the, on the, the side of how the communist government, they would be um, suppressing us uh, on an even escalating level. I don't think, um, no, personally, I, I, I feel that there are pro probably already Chinese police am among the Hong Kong police force. There have been several occasions where uh, the police commanders have been heard talking in Mandarin to their officers. So um, you know, on, on this note, I believe that uh, Hong Kong people are already facing uh, this sort of infiltration of the Chinese police into the, the Hong Kong police force. So, are you um, concerned about it escalating around National Day? Um, well, I mean, it's already on a daily basis of this sort of escalation where uh, the, the police are patrolling the streets, uh, people are arrested you know, just for, for being young, really. So I, I think we are already at that stage. And so um, you know, that, that is why we call for the US Congress and also international communities to, re to monitor this regime, that is uh, the, the Xi Jinping regime, because um, you know, we in Hong Kong, we are protecting these values that we all uh, believe in. And if we fail, then uh, you know, what, what knows what would happen to the world uh, and to the next stage. Yep. Thank you. Sunny? Yes. Okay, thank you for your question. Personally, I think um, on, on the National Day, actually, there will be more escalation on the movement. And because I know that the Chinese authority must want the Hong Kong people to try to respect the National Day. But on the other hand, Hong Kong protesters, they know that, they also know that it's important to have some symbolic movement on the National Day. And that's why there will be some escalation of the movement. But I doubt if the Chinese government, they dare to use the emergency law or send out, send out the PLA to come to Hong Kong. Because currently, China relies on Hong Kong very much. Many foreign investment from China is, uh, are still coming from Hong Kong. And that's why once if they deployed the PLA or try to use emergency law to crack down on Hong Kong protesters, I think this is not for, very promising for Hong Kong people and for the, uh, for the Beijing government. And Beijing gov government will not do something like that, I feel. Sharon, if you could talk about the elections a little bit also. Um, I think a couple of things I want is really important to, uh, that hasn't been raised. Um, in addition to the question of 
um, infiltration and use of decoys. Last August 2018, the People's Daily announced the establishment of the Greater Bay Area Police Cooperation Mechanism among Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau. Related to and part of this mechanism, the Guangdong Public Security Department conducted training of key Hong Kong police personnel in Guangdong. This has been followed up on. And one of the questions I think is important to press, either through the um, UN systems, is to raise the question of, really, what kind of training? I am pretty sure that the training did not include international standards on appropriate use of force. Um, and the special procedures of the UN special experts just last week issued a joint statement about concern and also raising these questions of the need to make the police, the Hong Kong police, there are very sophisticated, detailed standards on the use of force that you're supposed to de-escalate, not escalate. You're supposed to reduce harm, not create harm. And that there are a whole range of police crowd control mechanisms. And they're supposed to choose according to proportionality. So I wanted to um, just emphasize that. On the timing of National Day, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that Xi Jinping is not as powerful as we may think or as he would like us to think. And that it is true that with the consolidation of power, et cetera, et cetera, and his no term limit uh, now, both of the key positions, the fact is what you're getting to see, the tea leaves, if you look a little more closely, is that the party leaders inside are not happy with the way that Xi Jinping has, quote, handled the Hong Kong situation. And how do we know this? We know this because Carrie Lam, the chief executive on a Monday, I believe, said, no, 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 no withdrawal, no, 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 et cetera, et cetera. I withdrew it, no formal. Two days later, that kind of disingenuous explanation, I have heard the Hong Kong people. For goodness sakes, it's been three months. If you can't hear two million, three million people, <clears throat> why in two days did she suddenly say, I will now formally? So, um, Xi Jinping is actually in a lose-lose situation. It's a no-win situation. He's stuck between the hardliners, who I am pretty much concerned about, are pushing for military force, like because he has already shown he's failed. Deng Xiaoping took two months, shut down the whole 89 student and the democracy and free trade union movement. We are now in the third month, so under the party's dead time frame on how you can handle these mass disputes, he has failed. So he's in a pretty dicey situation. October 1st, this is not any anniversary. This is the 70th anniversary. So they have invested a year's worth of enormous investment in film festival, special documentaries made. They have said that no Chinese documentaries in this, you know, Chinese TV recently, they have to show the history and et cetera. There's an enormous amount of investment to keep the legitimacy and have a wonderful birthday celebration for the, for the country. So he's stuck. It can't look bad. On the other hand, he's stuck between the hardliners and the others who are saying, there's got to be a way to handle this, not the way you're doing it, because now we look terrible. Now we look like the thugs we are. And so I, I think that, that that is what we should be monitoring are the messages. And just last week, a very strange editorial appeared in Qiu Shi, which, as you know, is one of the major party organs. And in Qiu Shi, the editorial pointed out something very strange. It said, whether a country's political, this is our, our, our translation, sorry. Whether a country's political system is democratic and effective, one needs to mainly look at whether the country's leadership ranks can rotate or alternate. Uh, in accordance with the law in an orderly fashion. What does this mean? We don't know. Because just the fact that the Constitution eliminated the term limits for the top office doesn't mean he'll stay. So I think um, there are some other wild cards that are on the table that we need to keep an eye on in terms of how the US government can think about the options and policy options. Of course, we support the legislative initiatives. This is very important. But I think there's something much bigger underway in terms of the politics in Beijing that will absolutely have an impact on the decisions that will be made pre-October 1st and after. 
Thank you. I've, Dan, I've taken up too much time. I'm going to move on to. We'll let Dan. You want, you want to let Dan go? Yeah, let, you, you go first. All right. All right well, why, why don't we hold and we'll go to Senator Young? I just have a statement to make, and I regret I'm going to have to leave after this, but I, I want to say thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank you, Ms. Ho, for your courage, for your resolve, for your leadership in the face of, of, of great trial and tribulation. Uh, thank you for uh, the example you are setting for the world and for all that you're doing for freedom-loving uh, peoples. Um, I want to send a message to Beijing's communists. And my message is you cannot have it both ways. You cannot seek to trade with the wealthy nations of, of the world and rip off our intellectual property. You cannot seek to be a trusted international development partner and engage in predatory economic practices through your Belt and Road Initiative. And you cannot reap all the economic benefits that you enjoy under American law of Hong Kong special status while undermining your rights as Hong Kong Kongers while eradicating your political identity. We cannot allow this to happen. So I look forward to working with you. I will be signing on to the legislation offered by the co-chairman of this committee, as you have encouraged us to do so. And I'll be seeking other opportunities, perhaps in the immigration area, uh, to provide further relief uh, to Hong Kongers uh, who do not want to be a part of this predatory uh, uh, regime that calls itself communist, but in fact uh, is, 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 is really fascist uh, in many respects. Uh, and, and we must continue to press it to change its behavior. Thank you so much for your presence here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is no disputing the fact that under Xi Jinping, human rights abuses have seriously worsened uh, you name the area from torture, religious freedom. Ms. Holm, you talked about the synthesization of, of uh, religions where every single religion or faith, including the Falun Gong, Christians, Tibetan Buddhists, the Uyghurs, all have to comport to, to the communist model or else face severe torture, incarceration, and even death. Uh, it, is, it is incredible what he is doing and his regime. And of course, all of that will be uh, imposed on Hong Kong uh, unless there is a reversal of this trend. On, on human trafficking, the Trump administration has designated China as a tier three country uh, because of sex and labor trafficking. It has gotten seriously worse over the last several years. Uh, so every place you look, it is worse. Xi Jinping is, is bringing dishonor to himself and to his government uh, with his abuse of people. And I think we need to say that loud and clear. You know, the great father of democracy, Wei Jing Shong, once said, and I had him at a hearing, and I actually met him in Beijing uh, when he was let out briefly to get Olympics 2000, which the Chinese government didn't get. Uh, so they rearrested him and beat him almost senseless. Well, he said, you know, you Westerners don't get it. You do coddle dictatorship. You do uh, allow and enable by your weakness. You've got to look a dictatorship in the eye and say, we're not kidding. Conditionality of human rights either occurs or we're not going to be trading with you and allowing you to use that economic power that you get to further incarcerate and further repress. You know, the lessons of the Soviet Union were not learned when it came to China. I got elected in 1981. My first trip was to, to Moscow and Leningrad on behalf of Soviet Jews. And frankly, the Reagan administration stood up strongly uh, to the powers in Moscow and said, human rights matter. Uh, and it did matter. And we thankfully, we saw a change, of course, under Putin. It's still bad, but not as bad as it was during those years. I raise all of that because when it came to China, we have not learned the lessons of conditionality uh, with regards to human rights. Uh, and I say that with sadness, with, with great sadness. Um, you know, when we did the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act in 1986, not only did I vote for it, but we had a world coalition saying, this egregious behavior will not be tolerated, therefore we're going to hold you to account and no longer provide munitions, which uh, Mr. McGovern's bill, uh, which I've co-sponsored, would seek to do uh, with the police. That was Section 317, I believe, of that bill. And, and uh, Mr. Garrett, you might want to speak to that. But we've got to be serious 
about all of this. And, and I just bring this up because uh, it, it deeply concerns me that we just keep not learning the lessons. Nancy Pelosi, Frank Wolf, David Bonnier and I all opposed MFN for China after Tiananmen Square. George Herbert Walker Bush thought he could manage the whole thing. He was our ambassador uh, to China. And as it turned out, we managed it extraordinarily poorly. Bill Clinton came in and he said, let's link human rights with MFN trade. One year later, he delinked it. And the lesson learned by the dictatorship in Beijing was profits trump human rights. We now, and I have tried for five years to get my bill passed, our bill, it's a collective bill, House and Senate, bipartisan, and the same people who said just trade more and somehow China will matriculate from dictatorship uh, to democracy have been proven wrong again. And if it wasn't for the great people of Hong Kong standing up so powerfully at a great loss of their, of their liberty, going to prison, uh, being arrested, being harassed, and even killed and tortured, uh, that this Congress needs to wake up and say, finally, at long last, we're going to put conditionality on this. So if you want to speak to that, I would appreciate it. There have been a 1,000 arrests since the activities occurred. What is the status of the prosecutions? Joshua, we know, you know your case, but there are many other cases that, that are in obscurity right now. What is happening to those individuals? And just generally on the police, are the police largely newer recruits who are more ideologically aligned with Beijing, uh, or are they the old hands who have just now become even more repressive than they had been in the past? Uh, if you could speak to those things, I would appreciate it. With more than 1,500 Hong Kong were arrested in the past three months, more than 200 of them were prosecuted already. Um, I'm among one of them, and we're also aware on some of those activists were already detained inside prison before any trial start. And that's the sugar-coated rule of law and the Hong Kong-style legal system under the pressure of Beijing. Uh, I've been arrested and prosecuted with the charges of unauthorized assembly. Even I have the experience to be jailed for around 120 days, but the price I pay is just a small piece of cake. Because lots of our teammates, I, from my understanding, more than 100 of them face the riot charges, might be locked up in prison for more than 10 years. Uh, five years ago, during an umbrella movement, we were just arrested by an unlawful assembly, need to face maybe months or one to two years in jail. But now, youngsters at the age of 15, they should enjoy their summer holiday. They should spend the time, more time in the summer vacation with their friends and family. But now they are the one being prosecuted and need to face a trial, and maybe from 15 or 16 at the age, the golden year for themselves, might be already need to be locked up in prison. And also we have activists, Edward Leung, who fight for Hong Kong's freedom, already being locked up in prison, need to face six years in prison. Um, apart from the massive arrest and prosecution, it seems to be the tactics for Beijing to silence our voice. But with how our movement still keep our momentum, just like two weeks ago, more than 200,000 Hong Kongers marched towards U.S. consulate in Hong Kong, urged to pass the bill and to show the global solidarity. We're also aware that the cabinet of chief executive, which means the member from the executive council, last week openly declared that Hong Kong's chief executive enjoy the right to appoint any secret police. Secret police is not the terms created by activists or created by journalists. It is the terms written in the current ordinance and regulation. It could authorize the power for Hong Kong chief executive to appoint anyone, no matter they live in Hong Kong, they live in mainland, or, live in, they, or they have within any kind of background. They can be appointed to be the Hong Kong police force and continue to use life-threatening force to crack down on our protests. And that's the white terror and why all of us will describe Hong Kong is a police state. I would like to add to the fact that among those who have been arrested and charged for riot, uh, a lot of them have been on the sites, but they have not been in the front lines. They were just near the front lines. And some of them um, have been first aiders who have been helping other people 
getting up and getting away from the sites, uh, social workers, and of course the legislators uh, who have been arrested. Um, uh, they, they, they were not charged for riot, but uh, you know, they, that, that is something that is shocking to the Hong Kong people to have uh, these legislators arrested. And so um, on top of that, I would like to add that um, the situation that is in Hong Kong, it is spreading into the international world where uh, this communist tactic of you know, silencing people with fear and also with money, it's, it's everywhere really. It's not only in Hong Kong. As I said just now, um, there have been incidents in Australia where uh, government institutions, they have um, uh, kept away from me and, uh, and other Chinese artists uh, for, for, for fear of being associated with us. And also in Canada, where uh, Hong Kong activists have been banned from a gay pride uh, you know, who, because of security concerns, so they say. And so um, the, the fact that is the communist government, they, they use this sort of, um, the, the money where the, the, the brands and businesses, they would be adding this sort of suppression onto their employees and other people, and then everyone would be just silencing themselves. So um, this also would cause, is causing a lot of fear among Hong Kongers, and uh, that is why this movement has been largely anonymous, because we, we know that for a fact, if we show our faces, then we would be arrested and prosecuted for, for riot or unlawful assembly. I would like to supplement what uh, Denise um, has just mentioned about the, the problematic law. Actually, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations has declared the public order ordinance, which is a colonial law in Hong Kong. The Department of Justice and Police Force in Hong Kong, they can um, use this public order ordinance to prosecute those uh, protesters with a very uh, easy way. That means that once if the DOJ, the Department of Justice or the police force, they try to use the uh, public order ordinance to prosecute the protester, and then actually it's very difficult for them to be, uh, to be not uh, sued as guilty. And that's why um, this law should be abolished by the government and we urge that actually the international society should also be aware about this law. And apart from that, um, I had experience, I had a personal experience that a kid of, um, I, I, I had a, a tutorial kid, and then he was arrested in one of the political um, disputes um, around the confrontation around the, uh, during the movement. And that kid was, when that, when that kid was arrested, and he immediately asked the police office, uh, official, uh, officer, to ask him, can he call his lawyer? And the police officer, they told him that, of course you can't, because I want to torture you, because I want to um, make you suffer. And these police officers, they said something like that to a kid who is just under 18. And this is a real situation in Hong Kong that why, that's, that's why many people are very frustrated and angry about the police brutality problem. The, um, the prosecutions is related to not only the imposition of the public order, um, but uh, ordinance. It has to be an unlawful assembly. So the way in which the notice of no objection process contributes to that, that's the tool. And the tool is Hong Kongers then face this ridiculous situation where they have to have the police deny the application for a notice of no objection for a file for a group for a peaceful assembly that is to protest police violence. So you have the police denying the notice of no assembly, therefore making it an unlawful assembly, you know, for an assembly that is to protest police violence. Um, so that's really uh, um, important that through this kind of misuse of that process, they are really violating international standards for peaceful assembly by imposing this kind of unduly restrictive administrative um, uh, procedure. The police under this procedure then can act rampantly as both enforcement, prosecutor, 
because they're naming this, saying this is a riot. But a riot is a legal process. It's for the court to look at the evidence. It's for the court to see if this person engaged in illegal uh, uh, behavior and violent, et cetera. So right now, the police are acting as enforcement, prosecution, and executioner of orders. And, and that is uh, part of the problem with looking at when we talk about politicized, and on top of that, we have politicized decision making by the prosecution. This was um, also noted by independent UN experts several, maybe two years ago, saying that they were concerned about a potential pattern of politicized decisions that were being made and who to prosecute and who to, you know, who to, to um, pursue. There is an issue regarding whether or not Hong Kongers can get a fr fair trial in Hong Kong in the future. And a large reason for this is the heavy amount of propaganda coming from the central people's government, whether it is in Chinese state media organizations or it is in so-called mainstream organizations who um, uh, quote them and cite them uh, ubiquitously. Uh, so when the regime the Chinese regime characterized demonstrators as separatists, extremists, terrorists. This is already set, setting an expectation for the Hong Kong judiciary to act, not just as well as law enforcement, not only in the charges that they decide to delay against a protester, but also the, the sentences that they're trying to get after people. Uh, the pro Beijing United Front movement in Hong Kong has been very uh, aggressive in attacking judges that it feel that have been too lenient with protesters, and this goes back a number of years. They derogatorily re refer to them as yellow judges, referring to the uh, yellow ribbons from the Umbrella Revolution. Uh, there's been threats made by pro Beijing people towards the judiciary in general. by the National People's Congress. There's an expectation that Hong Kong judges have to uphold the national security of the Communist Party. So if you render a decision that's inconsistent with that national security expectation, you may be vulnerable to disqualification. Now this has not happened, but this is a logic that is being used to disqualify uh, candidates of the District Council, the Legislative Council elections, and so forth. Uh, regarding the police, uh, uh, touching on Sharon's comments earlier, uh, the Hong Kong police also went to Xinjiang as observers to learn on how they handled quote-unquote mass incidents. And there's very little visibility on that. We know that the PLA in Hong Kong, there is some interaction with them. The Hong Kong uh, PLA garrison commander observed some of their passing out their parades and so forth like that. But one of the most dangerous and I think uh, terrifying things for most Hong Kongers is that the Hong Kong police now act without wearing uniforms, without any type of identification. You can be grabbed off the street. You can be grabbed from your home. Nobody's showing you any type of formal identification. You don't know if they're a police officer. You don't know if they're a triad, a patriotic vigilante, or somebody from the mainland kidnapping you. So this is a major issue. Now, for the Communist Party, they view law enforcement as their concept of rule of law or rule by law. And so the support, basically the Hong Kong police have been given carte blanche to do whatever they want. And as Carrie Lam said before, the Hong Kong police are seen as the last line uh, in this. So the, the policing issue is a major problem in Hong Kong. Senator King. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative McAdams was here long before I arrived, so okay. I, I'll defer to him. Mr. McAdams, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, today marks a significant day in United States history. It was 232 years ago on this very day that uh, our forefathers signed the United States Constitution. So it's, uh, I think, with some significance that we welcome you here today to the United States Congress, the House and the Senate to share uh, your testimonies and, and as you share in this struggle, this global struggle of humanity for freedom and independence. So 
that, that constitution signed 232 years ago today created a federal system, one with a Senate and a House that oftentimes, by design, are in, uh, there's some tension between these two bodies. It created three branches of government, an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. It's an outgrowth uh, of that system as our two political parties that oftentimes also struggle for, uh, for our ideas to move forward. It created a system of a federal system with uh, now 50 states that also uh, there's a healthy tension, sometimes unhealthy, but there's a tension between th that system as we struggle uh, to move forward ideas and, and a rule of law. One thing that I, I think is important to note, though, is that we all stand together. This is a, a legislative and executive branch that we stand together, Republicans and Democrats, in support of the struggle for human rights, for the rule of law, and for freedom for Hong Kong. And uh, I would echo the, the sentiments that have been expressed earlier that you cannot, we cannot have it both ways. We cannot have a rule of law and human rights and the struggle for freedom uh, with the actions that we see that are undermining the very, uh, the very nature of that system in Hong Kong today. And so it's incredibly troubling to me to see what we have seen play out over the last six months. And, uh, and forecasting into the future some of the uh, efforts to undermine the sanctuaries of democracy and human rights that we see right now. So uh, some of those sanctuaries and, and foundations of, of, uh, of freedom, as we've seen in the United States and we also see in Hong Kong, uh, the, the uh, freedom of democracy and government through elections, the freedom of academia and for ideas to thrive in an academic system, the free economic freedom for uh, individuals and, uh, and economic competition, and rule of, of law where every individual is treated fairly and equally under the law and human rights are protected. So my concern, what I'd, I'd love for you to comment on is uh, where we go from here and with some very troubling signs on the horizon. So I'd like you to comment on uh, Mr. Wong. Uh, and let me commend all of you who are examples uh, and, and the founders of freedom whose names I hope will be remembered 232 years from now in the struggle for freedom in Hong Kong, but Mr. Wong, Ms. Ho, Mr. Chung, and Ms. Hom for your efforts and struggles for Hong Kong. The, I'd love for you to comment on, first of all, Mr. Wong, I'm, I'm, uh, the struggle in, in elections for individuals to step forward. I've, I'm, uh, over the last several years, the government has, as you referenced, has repeatedly rejected the nomination of candidates running for political office who have supported or been affiliated with self-determination. What challenges does that impose today and going forward for individuals who are willing to, to put their, themselves and their names forward? Um, taking that same look at the foundations of freedom of thought to academia, what support our academic, do academic institutions give to students as they raise their voices in support of intellectual freedom uh, and human rights? Uh, and also to the uh, economy and uh, free economy as businesses. Ms. Uh, Ho, I believe, as you spoke about uh, some of the concerns with Cathay Pacific and, uh, and um, efforts that undermine individuality and freedom of thought of, of in the marketplace of ideas in, in the workplace. What is, what is happening in these respective spheres and foundations of democracy, and how can we best support uh, freedom of thought? Um, so just let me explain what's on the mind uh, of the young generation. In the past few years after the end of umbrella movement, lots of youngsters, no matter they uphold different kind of political belief, they still have the awareness and consensus. They hope their voice can be heard inside this institution. Apart from talk to the street, joining protests, it's also significant for us for push forward political system and election reform. Unfortunately, with those political censorship, even I'm considering to run for office and I will make the formal announcement on late of September or early October. I still aware that how Beijing hope to bar the whole generation of youngsters to enter the institution. But it's lucky that with the determination and courage of Hong Kongers, they just turned the whole generation of youngsters to be dissident. 
and not only the generation of baby boomers, even the generation of Gen X and millennials, all they join the fight with solidarity and unity. So I would just make it clear, Hong Kong is not only suffering from the political crisis, we are also suffering from the humanitarian crisis, especially how Hong Kong police force just hardly hardline suppress on us, no matter the sexual harassment experienced by young lady arrested or how injured protesters would be pulled down from the ambulance by riot police directly or how arrested person is, is really difficult for them and being refused it to contact lawyer or even seek for any kind of medical treatment. I think this kind of hardline suppression will just ho turn hold of the ge my generation and the generation younger than me, no matter on the street or get inside the institution, we will keep on together with this uphill battle and we hope the US Congress can stand with Hong Kong. I'll go, I'll go. Um, so yes, on the, on the cultural side, um, and also on the, the freedom of thought uh, side of things, it, it has been, 90% you know, of it probably has been eroded, uh, where at least the, the whole show business has been uh, in, is in the control of the communist government. Uh, me, along with just a, a very small handful of uh, actors and singers have spoken up for these movements, but the rest of the celebrities, they have kept their silence and they have been forced into participating in these uh, support campaigns on social media of, uh, oh, I support the Hong Kong police or I am a protector of the national flag campaigns where they have to voice out their um, support to the, the Chinese government or else they would be prosecuted, uh, you know, censored like pe people like us. So um, businesses, of course, they have been pressured also into uh, obstructing these freedoms of Hong Kongers, um, namely MTRL, our subway system, they have closed down uh, stations uh, in times of protest, um, therefore uh, making it very easy for the police to arrest people and also very difficult for the people to leave the sites. And that was a result of, um, uh, I, I believe it was an article uh, that was in the People's Daily, the state newspaper, uh, where they have named the MTRO corporate, corporation, uh, saying that they have been helping the people. So um, I do think that in a, a free society, these businesses and corporations, they do have a um, obligation, a social responsibility to keep up this kind of integrity uh, to at least to safeguard our freedoms, which uh, they have failed to do so. And um, like right now, we, we do, ha do not have uh, much solutions to these problems because um, Aside um, of the people protesting, uh, you know, these businesses, they are um, exercising their suppression onto uh, their people. So um, we, we hope that this Hong Kong Human Rights and Demo the Democracy Act, with their, these sanctions on, on uh, the government officials, and hopefully you know, if this could extend to these corporations who have been violating uh, the basic law, the freedom of speech and uh, of the people, uh, hopefully that this would um, be mon monitoring the, the businesses and also, of course, the government institutions in Hong Kong. Um, from the ac academic perspective, I believe we still have, we, we need to have a correct understanding on China first. Because in 1989, when Professor Fukuyama famously declared that this is the end of the history because he believed democracy is the ultimate form of human government, and the, uh, the, all the ideology, communism, or other authoritarianism will have no place in the coming world. But apparently, two decades after, he, he gave his um, speech, he's wrong. And we cannot still using the mindset of the old times that we can be, that we should continue the engagement policy towards China. We should abandon the engagement policy and try to use a more assertive way, try to understand China. Because in the campus, 
we know that Chinese government, they try to establish a lot of Confucius Institute around the world. And by that Confucius Institute, they are, pop, uh, they are creating propaganda, try to influence the youth in other countries, including your kids. And this is not reasonable. Canada government last year, they started to shut down some of the Confucius Institutes. And I believe actually this is a global fight because when we uphold the academic freedom and freedom of speech in the campus, the Chinese government apparently, they do not agree on that. And when many Hong Kong people over the past few months, they support the movements in Hong Kong and they have organized a lot of rallies across the globe in Australia, in UK, in US. They have received a lot of threatening letters and uh, they, they, they are being followed. Their home address are being posted on those um, social medias. And that's why we need the, all the fewer countries, including US, to support Hong Kong people in the campus and to uphold the academic, uh, to, to support the academic freedom in the long run. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the question that, every, that all of this also is related to is China's clear exercise of soft, hard, and sharp power. And so I want to say a couple of things on the academic front. Um, in the US, we have over 300,000 Chinese students from the mainland and also students elsewhere. I think Joshua saw recently close up and personal uh, when he spoke at Columbia uh, what the actions of the students are. I'm not raising it to think that there's an easy answer, but I do think that we must be thinking about how do we, and I use it for lack of a better word, engage the fact that we're welcoming students into U.S. institutions. Um, I taught, I teach a human rights course at NYU as well, as an, and I had some mainlanders who did not want to take my course because they're afraid to take the course because if they take the course, other people were reporting on who took the course by Sharon, you know, human rights in China director. And then even um, recently, if I had students in the class as observers or whatever from the mainland, so I'm saying that the censorship is on mainland students as well. So we do have them protesting, but we also have to recognize they are all under surveillance with families uh, back home. Um, I, I really want to echo Denise's call to bring in the role of the companies, and in particular, as the Protect Hong Kong Act uh, moves forward in discussions, and I know that is going through a legislative process, I think it would be really good to think about and address the question of the U.S. companies, uh, because not only will the denial of export licenses really address the issue, it will address the issue of no longer being compl complicit, but will it address the issue of the actual um, category of uh, lethal and non-lethal materials? And I wanted to point out that China hosts the China International Exhibition on Police Equipment every two years. The next one, they all held in Beijing, will be held on May 12th, to the 15th, that's a really important date. And they um, sell and they have thousands of exhibitors from all over the world and companies. And in the past, we have been monitoring many US companies have gone to exhibit and sell and then afterwards report very proudly on the, um, the are we singing? Okay, not yet, not yet, right? Okay, not yet, not singing yet. Um, but they've also reported on the hundreds, the millions of dollars of contracts that they were able to secure in Beijing. So I think one um, thought might be to, aside from, or in addition to export licenses, um, what about technology transfers? What about uh, collaboration? What about them training the um, Chinese partner companies? What, about, what are the other things that need to be in place so that because China has been named an economic competitor for the US, it's not an even playing field. They're an economic competitor where the SOEs are dominating the economy. You are not investing in all your com the US companies, but China is investing in all the key industries, and that is technology, and, uh, AI, the military sector, financial services, and then the ICT sector, which is completely state-owned enterprise in terms of the key ICT. So I want to ask one final thought for what can be done going forward. Next year on the Human Rights Council, at the end of this year, China rotates off. And according to the rules, can't come back on in 2020. 
I think that is the year in which the U.S. government, I know you have left the council for um, uh, various uh, 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 analyses of its effectiveness, but that does not take away the fact that the U.S. is still viewed as a leading player among all the member states in the council. You can exercise your role as an observer. You can also exercise your very influential role in working with other democratic governments to issue joint statements, joint initiatives, and joint. So I think 2020 is particularly important. And in particular, that is the year to push, because you're also on the NGO committee of ECOSOC. That is the year to support and push for the reforms that are needed to allow independent civil society groups to be able to um, participate. As you know, my organization has had applied for ECOSOC status and over the last 30 years, and both times you can't make it out of the NGO committee because China just looks at us and goes, and that's it. It's end of story. So I think it's very important that the U.S. can uh, raise the issues, not only as an observer in Human Rights Council, but in the General Assembly. And, and I know you're quite active on the third and fifth committees. That's where I think it's really important to exercise leadership. 2020 is the year you can push, because China will be there with its client states and threatening everybody else to support them while they're not there. But the point is, they won't have a vote. So I think it's a good year to get some traction. Um, I'll just make a couple quick comments. One is U.S. has law enforcement cooperation with the Hong Kong police, and this may need to be reconsidered or look at more strongly in the future. Uh, second, um, basically as far as companies go in Hong Kong, there's a one country, two systems, apartheid-like system, where patriot, patriotic companies are privileged over other com companies. If you happen to be a pro-democracy supporter, you're at the bottom, if, if not an enemy. Uh, Regarding Hong Kong universities, uh, if I remember my count correctly, there's seven public ones. They're all funded by the SAR government. So this puts on pressure on the type of academic uh, agenda, research interests, and so forth like this. And there are real problems if you're considered a sensitive personality, such as Benny Tai, or if you're researching sensitive issues uh, that may or may not be clearly evident. Uh, there's also a lot of things that happens on Hong Kong related to academic and other freedoms that are above the water and below the water line. One of them is one of the things that the Hong Kong police are doing right now are ID checks uh, writ large. So even if you're not arrested, your name is being recorded and associated as being at a protest site. Now this may come down later on in some hiring decision, some vetting process by state-owned enterprises or other patriotic Hong Kong companies. Uh, Former Chief Executive C.Y. Long discussed such a possibility back, I think it was around 2014 uh, or 2012. And my last comment would be that uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises incorporated in Hong Kong should not be treated as Hong Kong companies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we have two senators here. There's a vote on, um, and so um, I'm gonna yield to Senator King, uh, but uh, I would, if we could just keep our answers short so they both can get their questions, uh, and I think that would be helpful. Senator King. Thank you. Ms. Holm, I, I'm struggling with uh, the fact that we've got an island of democracy in a sea of repression. You've got a country which is now seems to be per perfecting the control state. Millions of cameras, facial recognition, uh, repression of the Uyghurs, religion, everything, and yet You've got Hong Kong. The two, you've got two societies moving in the opposite direction. Very briefly, what's the solution, or is there one? Where, where does this end as a practical matter? I mean, as a practical matter, there's 7 million, I understand, Hong Kongers and almost, what, 800 million mainlanders, whatever that, that number is. The other piece that I wanted to ask is, is there any sympathy for the Hong Kongers within the mainland? Is there a nascent, I wouldn't call it a democracy movement, but at least a freedom, freedom of expression movement, or is the government in such firm control that's a fantasy? Give me a picture of where this goes. Um, thank you, though I have no answers because this is an ongoing struggle, but I do wanna say that the control state 
you've put your finger right on it. A control state is China has built a whole ecosystem of control through the technology, through the law. We didn't even talk about the cybersecurity law. Most in the history of and, the world. And it, the most comprehensive because it also is built on um, self-censorship. It's also built on social, a whole social platforms of community uh, uh, reporting on each other. Um, so there is this whole ecosystem which is pretty comprehensive that feeds each other. But the one thing about technology that's interesting is that the asymmetry of power that you could have a very powerful authoritarian state, it has not been able, notwithstanding the, 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 the mass crackdowns on lawyers, notwithstanding the torture on the mainland, not, notwithstanding the killing of thou, untold thousands in 1989 of tanks, they have not, the Communist Party has not been able to shut down people. Chinese people who continue to work for a whole range of human rights. So that's number one. The second thing we haven't really mentioned is that Hong Kong has always been, since 89, the only city, and I will say within formal China, that has over 100,000 people every year on June 4th remembering. It was Hong Kong students, it was Hong Kong journalists who went up to Beijing to support the democracy movement. And there are very moving stories of the protesters knowing that the tanks were coming. But can the, can they the, said, let the, the Hong Kong students, they must make it safely back because they will tell our can story. The, can the Beijing regime tolerate Hong Kong? Isn't Hong Kong a, a, a fundamental threat to this whole control regime? Half of Hong Kong is a fundamental threat. The part of Hong Kong that can be its golden goose that lays the golden egg, they like that pot, but that goose isn't living in a free-range farm. And they want that golden goose to absolutely, you know, be like, keep laying those eggs, but, you know, you're going to have no air, no this, no that. So they're trying to do something impossible. They're trying to keep half of Hong Kong denying a reality of who and what Hong Kong is because Hong Kongers have, we have had a history of freedom. And we have had a history of working courts and independence. You can't just wipe it. Sympathy for mainlanders. I know, um, because I also teach human rights seminars at some institutions in Hong Kong, uh, that mainlanders participate in the, in the demonstrations. And I can tell you, when they participate in the demonstrations in Hong Kong, million people, their parents back home on the mainland will get a knock on the door and a visit from the public security saying, your daughter, your son is in those marches, tell them to stop. So the, they're both in Hong Kong, mainlanders in Hong Kong are very, um, it's not just what you see in the media of them fighting and protesting and fighting. There are Hong Kongers who support and are inspired by, that's what Beijing is afraid of. They're afraid, that's why they first censored everything, and then suddenly they realize, oh my gosh, we can't censor it. Everybody actually has those illegal VPNs, and they are getting the information. So then they started doing the disinformation, because the silent, you know, the blackout didn't work, so they started the disinformation. The, the other point is that there are mainlanders from the beginning in June, who have expressed support for the Hong Kong democracy movement online. What has happened to them? Arrested, detained, threatened, intimidated, etc. So notwithstanding the full force of an authoritarian police state, they're not able to shut it down. And Mr. King, they're not able to tell mainlanders who do see what they're seeing and who are not afraid and are willing to also pay the price to support Hong Kong's movement because they understand that if Hong Kongers can hold the line, then the mainlanders who also want democracy and freedom can also have a chance. But Hong Kongers are the front line. Well, I, I want to join my colleagues in thanking you all. It's hard for us to conceive of the courage that it takes. There's no doubt that in this room today is someone reporting to Beijing about each of your That's testimony. Right. That's right. And, and, so please make sure we're stated properly. And, I don't want any misquotes. And, uh, and, and I want to thank you for your courage to, to speak the truth. And uh, hopefully we will be able to pass some of this legislation to, uh, to, to make it clear to the, to the regime in Beijing that uh, democracy is an important value 
and that uh, we're just not going to pay lip service to it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, Senator Daines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank this panel for coming before this commission, providing some perspective and expertise on this important and very timely topic. As many of you know, I spent uh, more than five years uh, living in Guangzhou and part of that time in Hong Kong back in the 1990s when I was in the private sector raising a family. In fact, we have four children. Our two youngest children were both born in Hong Kong. I'm deeply concerned uh, with the ongoing erosion of autonomy and human rights in the region, and I will tell you I stand with the citizens of Hong Kong. In fact, just this past month, I helped lead a legislative exchange between the U.S. and six LegCo leaders who came to my home state of Montana. This event was important to better understand the situation in Hong Kong and, uh, and identifying what some of the key issues were and have a very open and free exchange. As the leader of the free world, we, the United States, and the entire world must continue to support the autonomy and the freedoms of Hong Kong. It is one country, two systems. I was in Hong Kong on June 30th, 1997, and saw the Union Jack come down for the last time. The Hong Kong central government needs to work with protesters to accept the demands put forward by the citizens of the country, and the use of excessive force by the police must end immediately. We must continue to work together towards building a strong relationship between our two countries. The question, I'll start with Mr. Wong. Uh, the protesters have formed a consensus around five demands, including withdrawal of the extradition bill and, of course, universal suffrage. Does the government need to comply with all five demands immediately, or is there a phased or alternative outcome that might be acceptable? Hong Kong people fight for free election and universal suffrage since three decades ago, even earlier than I born. All the five demands is the consensus of Hong Kongers took to the street in the past three months, and all those five demands are also within the existing constitutional framework. Especially, Beijing made the promise in the Sino-British Joint Declaration and recognized the importance to let Hong Kong people enjoy freedom and autonomy, especially with the quote of Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. So I would say that democracy movement and protests must continue until the day we have democracy, even we strongly experience the state capitalist regime crackdown on Hong Kong human rights. So I would say that now we have continued our summer of discontent and becoming the year of discontent. We just hope the world to understand more how Hong Kong people were in the difficult time in this long-term and uphill battle. Let, let, so, let me, um, if I could, interject. thank you. I've got a vote yes. coming. I've got to get to it. I'm probably going to get uh, there quickly. But uh, a follow-up question. How do you expect uh, Chief Executive Carrie Lam, how do you think she'll respond to these demands? And how much power does she have to make concessions? Or would Beijing have the final say? That's an extremely good question. Carrie Lam is a puppet government handpicked by Beijing, and she is not the decision maker. What we realize is withdraw the bill or not, stopping police brutality or not, or, let allow, or allowing Hong Kong people enjoy free election or not, all depends on Beijing authorities instead of chief executive of Hong Kong. Carrie Lam doesn't have a say on it. She's just following the order from Beijing authorities, especially on how the state council in Beijing regularly hold a press conference in the past few weeks to criticize on Hong Kong protests. It already showed that how Carrie Lam can solve the political crisis by her personal capacity. All right, thank you. I've got to get, I'd love to keep the discussion going longer, but I've got to go down the we floor. We appreciate it. Th thank thank you. you very much. Thank yes. you very much. And I think Mr. Smith has one additional question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate it. Um, if I could, and Ms. Hom, you did mention it, so, and I think it bears a, a little further scrutiny. <clears throat> one of the notions of there's no such thing as a free lunch, in my opinion, applies with um, on steroids to the issue of Confucius centers, which are just agents of influence uh, pushing the Beijing line. In the past, in both my subcommittee on human rights, which I chaired, and this commission, 
Uh, I've held a series of hearings on Confucius centers, as well as on those entities, universities, colleges that get uh, access to the mainland China especially, uh, and get an enormous number of perks, money, uh, physical plant venues uh, for their colleges or universities, uh, including NYU. Um, and matter of fact, I had the chancellor of NYU testify in one of my hearings and asked that I could go and speak, and he allowed me to come and, and give a speech or a lecture on human rights in, in Shanghai at, at the NYU campus. But the concern is that there are in route to a thousand or something like that globally, that is to say the Chinese government with these Confucius centers, we have 96 in the United States, um, 82 are public, 14 are private. Um, one of the things that I'm most concerned about, and Rob Portman and I asked for a GAO report on this that finally came out in February of this year, uh, and that is to look at the terms and conditions, uh, which really is mostly secret, but we have a situation where Handpicked teachers come to the United States, come to Africa, go, go to Africa, I should say, Latin America, everywhere. Uh, and they seemingly are doing education in the language and culture, but it's all about uh, the worldview and the, the domestic defense of, of um, Xi Jinping's policies, uh, including Hong Kong. My question very specifically is, what are the Confucius centers? Do you have any insights as to what they're saying about what's going on in Hong Kong right now? And those universities and colleges, US-based, that are in China today, what are they able to say and do without fear of retaliation, like at the NYU uh, campus in Shanghai, about this great human rights, pro-democracy effort on the part of all of you uh, in Hong Kong? Start off. Um, the. Um, Thank you. I, I, I think it's important also to note that the Confucius Institutes and the pushbacks have also been led by really active, wonderful activism by Students for Free Tibet and the Tibetan community supported by the Uyghurs. And I think they've had some really good victories that show you really can push back and get the institutions to be more um, accountable and, and uh, reliable. I think, I think um, um, the, the quick answer to what are they saying, it's what can they say will always be under the guideline right now. Under um, the, the now the ideological campaign that's underway where every single party non-member has to participate in political study, that the line of the day, what can be reported in Xinhua, what can be reported in the news, everything will be determined from the top. And you, if you say anything, and as you know, under the new regulations, uh, under the Cybersecurity Act for the news, news is defined very broadly to include opinion, it, and commentary, including blogging, including... So you can't say, blog, think, anything, except what the line comes down. So when the line comes down in Hong Kong, currently, the line is, it is a riot, backed up by black hands, led by the US, um, uh, interfering in a domestic uh, uh, an affair and, and violating China's sovereignty. This is the same old chestnut you've, you know, we all hear over and over and they gotta get a better story here. But that's what they keep saying. And so I think that is now the dominant, what, we're, what anyone can say. Because if you say anything against that, for example, you have a different idea. Not only are you violating the new news regulations, you're also running the risk of subversion, incitement, because that is defined as you know, going against the party's view. So I think um, that's uh, why it is so important that the, that the authoritarian system in the mainland must change. It's got to change, or I think it's still, you know, I think that Hong Kong people, I know I've heard some of my, my friends and colleagues say to the US, please save us. Um, I, I actually have another angle on that. I think Hong Kong people will save ourselves. I think Hong Kong people are going to do it. What I think is necessary from the international community is please help make the human cost less because it's very clear and heartbreaking that the young people are ready to go to the mat. And I think the key is, as I think the US government and this commission is doing, is to stand by so that the human costs can be mitigated a little bit. Understood, but how do the teachers in the Confucius Institute get their marching orders? So uh, uh, th this is like going inside of a black box, but let me speculate. Yeah. Um, I am pretty sure that all the curricula are approved and reviewed. 
I'm pretty sure they don't exercise academic freedom and say, here's a creative thing I can do about Hong Kong. You know, I'm pretty sure that they're all approved curricula. How do we know this? Because you will see nothing there about 89. You will know, yeah, there are just big holes in that history, what's happening. And all of the, um, you'll, you'll probably read about the diverse ethnic groups in China, uh, happy people, uh, happy Tibetans, happy Uyghurs, you know. Um, th you'll probably see that version of what is happening. So I'm pretty sure. The other thing is um, if the, those institutes are also monitored. So if anyone says anything that actually challenges the dominant narrative, I'm pretty sure that teacher will be in trouble. Um, so I think it's pretty tightly controlled, and the money is the, um, what do you see the word, the, 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 the enticement to universities? And I think not only just for the Confucius Institutes, they sometimes come along with other really good goods like an endowed chair, like money for a chair, like money for a program. So I think there's this, this kind of collapse. Um, because um, Senator Daines left, can I say something to him anyway? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Senator, I'm so sorry, but I really think it's important. As somebody who um, uh, loves Hong Kong, and and personally and professionally, and as a member of the um, the from the private sector, I think we need to also remember that every single SOE, state-owned enterprise, has a party committee, and now that requirement has extended to foreign to companies with foreign investments and foreign companies. Um, I had a, far, uh, a Canadian company ask me, how could that be? Why are they making us establish a party committee? I said, you're not being...